All right, everybody, welcome to our late night on fossils for uh, academic year 2021-2022. This is uh, our October and late night and first late night of the academic year. And Ria and I will be with you for our first um, uh, trivia of the year. So we hope you had a great summer and we welcome you back. We hope you have fun with us last year and we have more planned for you this one. So um, are we ready to start? Ria, are you ready? Ready. Yes, here we go. So uh, for all of you, if you were here with us last year, you know the drill, but if you're new, um, please uh, scan the scan me here on the left hand side or go uh, to www.menti.com and um, you're going to uh, look for the uh, enter the code 9493C46442. And when you do that, we're going to be able, you're going to be able to answer the questions from the trivia and uh, Ria and I will be able to see your answers. So, uh, keep track of your score uh, and you can write in the chat. If something comes up, we're also monitoring the chats, but, uh, please just go uh, ahead and, and participate with WMT. It makes it so much more fun for us. Uh, and we can go ahead and get started. Question number one of our fossil trivia tonight is a scientist who studies the fossil remains of plants or animals is called A, A, zoologist, B, archaeologist, C, paleontologist, or D, environmental scientist. Let's see what's the answer. So we're getting quite a few votes right now, just waiting for some more people, it seems like, are joining. Okay. It seems like overwhelmingly there's one answer here. It seems like a lot of the uh, participants are putting in. And all right, so the the answer that most of you have chosen was for C, paleontologist. And I saw one answer here in the chat that was for B, but let's see. Let's see what the answer is. And uh, you guys are correct. The answer is C, paleontologist. And it is very common to think that paleontologists are, are actually archaeologists. And I, I think maybe it's because of the pictures and, and the, the mental pictures that we have from seeing some of these scientists in the field uh, around the world. So, but archaeologists actually, they study the history of human civilizations and how these groups of uh, these populations use their artifacts uh, and, and remain remaining. So we look at a, a lot of different parts of the world. Um, so we're going to be going into question number two. What part of an animal is most likely to fossilize? A, muscles, B, bones and teeth, C, skin, or D, organs? Getting a lot of votes for one answer and not any of the others. So let's <laughs> find out what they choose. All right. Uh... All right. So it looks like most of you have chosen the answer B for bones and teeth. And that again is correct. You're expert guys tonight. Uh, the, the harder parts of the plants and animals are usually the ones that get preserved, although it's not it's, it's uncommon, but it can happen. Sometimes we may have some parts of the skin that can be preserved, but that's more rare. Uh, let's go into question number three. In which type of rock are fossils most likely to be preserved? A, sedimentary rocks. B, igneous rocks, C, metamorphic rocks, or D, granite? Okay. Looks like most of the votes are here for A, sedimentary rocks. 
And that is correct again. We're going, you're doing perfect this night. Uh, so when we look at sedimentary rocks, fossils are in this type of rock when uh, the animal dies, but the body is not completely decomposed, but it's buried and time passes and then it gets filled in. And so uh, when these layers harden, that's where we have the sedimentary rock, uh, as you can see in the diagram around here. And we're going to go on on question number four. What is the name of this creature? Do you see this here? A, trilobite, B, clam, C, nautilus, or D, ammonite? Uh, it's a tie so far. Oh, it's still a tie. I'm getting more votes and it's still a tie. Let's see if anyone can break. Uh, uh, one by one vote, uh, the answer for D. Ammonite, but the second highest uh, answer was also C for Nautilus. All right. Okay, let's see. And the answer is D, Ammonite. And you can see here different species. So this is a mollusk, it's a marine mollusk uh, that is called Ammonite. And um, they are similar to the modern squil squid, octopus, or cuttlefish. Uh, let's go on to the next question. So, question number five. The Devonian period, approximately 420 to 359 million years ago, was known as the age of the A, reptiles, B, fishes, C, mammals, or D, trilobites. And thank you, Austin. I've seen your responses in the chat. Thank you for participating through the chat. Getting on a few more votes, I think. Mm -hmm. It's almost a tie, actually. Okay, so the highest number of votes goes to fishes, mm -hmm. and the second highest goes to D, trilobites. Okay. And the answer is actually fishes. The Devonian period is often called the age of the fish. And um, so because this is when fish started to became diverse, so we had a lot more uh, fish, fish species during this time. You can see in the image that we have here, the Doncleosteus. And uh, you can see the comparison here to what humans would look like. So that was a really big fish. So it's not necessarily like, the smaller species that we may have in mind right now. Um, and then also the armored placoderms are one of the most famous fish from this time. Um, we're gonna continue. Uh, but before we go to question number six, we wanna make an announcement. If you just join us right now, please scan the scan me here on the left or go to www.menti.com and enter the code 94936442 and answer the questions, keep track of your record and your score. And uh, at the end, you can let us know how we did. If you don't have that working, you can also use the chat, but welcome if you just join us. We hope you enjoy the rest of our questions. So let's move on now to question number six. Giant dragonflies of the Carboniferous period could have wingspans up of up to A, 6 inches, B, 10 inches, C, 28 inches, or D, 45 inches. Very close tie right now. Okay, and so it looks like the highest number of votes goes to the answer for C, 28 inches. That's excellent because that is the uh, correct answer. Um, 
So they live about 300 million years ago. And if you think about 28 inches, that's over two feet, right? If you think about the ones that we see normally right now, they're only a couple inches, but uh, 28 inches is, is a lot for, for an insect, for a dragonfly. Question number seven, what was the first dinosaur fossil discovered in New Jersey? A, Ornithomimus, B, Hadrosaurus, C, Stegosaurus, or D, Velociraptor? Most people know this one. Okay, so it looks like the highest number of votes goes to B, Hadrosaurus. Great, and that is correct. Hadrosaurus was discovered in Haddonfield, New Jersey in 1858. And this was the first nearly complete dinosaur to have ever discovered up to that time. And it is the state dinosaur, right? I was just about to say that. Yes, it is. <laughs> so you can tell your friends and family that New Jersey has a state dinosaur. Excellent. Question number eight, which of these other fossils can also be found in New Jersey? A, ammonites, B, mosasaurus, C, shark teeth, or D, all of the above? Okay, so it looks like most of the answers here are going for D, all of the above. And you're correct again. Ammonites, mosasaurus, and chart can all be found at Big Brook Park in Coles Neck, New Jersey. And uh, actually, we uh, at the museum have usually once or twice a year, depending on the weather, we have our field trip, so if you're interested in our field trips, just go to our website and you can sign up uh, when we reopen for, for our field trips again, okay? Question number nine. The bone wars of the late 1800s, a period of intense competitive fossil hunting, occurred between which two famous paleontologists? A. Edward drinker Cope and Othniel Marsh, B, Jake Horner and Bob Baker, C, Barnum Brown and Richard Owen, or D, Mary Annie and William Buckland? It's almost a tie between two of these options here. Oh, it is an exact tie now. Uh, let's see if there's gonna be a tiebreaker. Okay, I guess not. So the tie is between A, Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Marsh, and C, Barnum Brown and Richard Owen. All right, and the, you are in the correct answer, but the correct answer is A, Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Marsh. And you can see their pictures here. Um, while their scientific field led to financial and social ruin, they did make extremely important contributions to the field of paleontology, right? So it's almost like an obsession. <laughs> um, so we're going to go on to question number 10. What is the name of this creature? Have you ever seen that before? A. Crinoid. B. Centipede. C, trilobite, or D, eripterid. Oh, it's um, fluctuating between a tie of three answers right now. Oh, I think we're getting more answers for one. Nope, still a tie. 
Okay, so we have a three-way tie between the options of A, crinoid, C, trilobite, and D, eurypterid. All right, so let's check it out. And the correct uh, answer is D, eurypterid, uh, and they're also known as sea scorpions. So um, they are an extinct group of aquatic animals, and they live uh, between 467 and 250 million years ago. Um, and we actually, in our store, we have some samples of something like that. So again, when we reopen, you can go and visit the gift shop at the Geology Museum. Um, all right, so this is time to make another announcement. If you came in uh, just now, uh, we are doing our fossil trivia right now, and we are going to, uh, you can go and scan the scan me over here, or you can go to the www.menti.com and enter the code 94936442, and that is going to allow you to answer the questions and we can see your responses, okay? And keep track of your score as we move on to our next question. Question number 11, during which time period did dinosaurs first evolve? A, Carboniferous, B, Triassic, C, Jurassic, or D, Cretaceous? Looks like most of you know the Correct answer, but I will wait just another second. Okay, and it looks like most of the most of you guys have put the answer for B, Triassic. And that is correct. Dinosaurs evolved during the Triassic period from a group of animals called the Archosaurus, which also include the pterosaurs and crocodilians, which they're not dinosaurs, but they lead it to the dinosaurs. And then uh, question number 12, which of these animals is not a dinosaur? A, Mosasaurus, B, Dimetrodon, C, Pterodactyl, or D, all of the above? I'm curious to see your answers. We have uh, votes for all of them right now. <laughs> all right, so, we, so for the first answer, we have C and D at tied. So for C for pterodactyl, D for all of the above, and the other two are tied are A for Mosasaurus and B for Dimetrodon. So go ahead, Patty, tell us the correct answer. <laughs> so you're all correct because it's all of the above. <laughs> um, so none of these animals are actually uh, dinosaurs because all dinosaurs, they have certain hip structure and the way their legs move and, and are shaped and structure. Um, and since none of these three animals have that same structure. They are not considered dinosaurs, even if they live at the same time of dinosaurs. All right, question number 13. Dinosaurs lived at the same time as which of these creatures? A. Woolly mammoth, B, saber toothed cats, C, early humans, or D, none of these. It looks like most of you are putting down D for none of these. Let's see. And correct, D, none of these dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago, while the woolly mammoths, humans, and sable suit cats live only within the last few million years. So they never actually interacted. And if you have seen this movie on here on the left, it's not correct. They never uh, coexisted in the same time period. Also, one of the Ice Age movies shows the T-Rex and like Manny and everyone hanging out. That didn't happen. 
Oh no, my heart is broken. <laughs> I still like the movie. <laughs> All right, question number 14. During which time period did the dinosaurs go extinct? A, Jurassic, B, Cretaceous, C, Permian, or D, Cambrian? a lot of answers um it's like most of the answers are for b cretaceous and that is correct cretaceous uh is the correct answer and uh if we talk to scientists they will tell you that dinosaurs went extinct after a meteorite hit the earth and then the, uh that uh, um, that event filled the atmosphere with dust and debris that drastically changed the climate. Question number 15, which of these animals did not live during the Cretaceous period? A, mammoth, B, sharks, C, mosasaurus, or D, turtles? We're getting a lot of answers um, and the votes for, are for, mostly are for A, mammoths. All right. You were paying attention. That is correct. <laughs> uh, mammoths are the only animal listed that did not live during the Cretaceous period. And if you were paying attention to the Ice Age story that we <laughs> was talking about, uh, that also uh, gave you a hint, but all other animals live, al live along the side of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous. So question number, oh, again, if you just join us, just go to the scan me or go to www.menti.com and enter the code 94936442 and keep track of your score so you can tell us how you did at the end. Uh, we are entering uh, the last, the, the final set of questions for uh, the trivia tonight before our craft. So we're going on question number 16. What is the scientific name for fossilized droppings? A, coprolite, B, gastrolith, B, burgies, or D, dudicus? Oops, for A, coprolite. And that is correct. Coprolites are very important because they can tell scientists about the diet of an extinct animal and also about their size. And if you're ever in Orlando, Florida and you see their science museum, they have a collection of coprolites. Um, question number 17, which of these animals would be most likely to, preserve, to be preserved in amber? A, birds, B, lizards, C, insects, or D, frogs? A lot of answers for mainly one answer here, and that answer is for C, insects. Excellent. All of you watched Jurassic Park, right? Uh, so uh, insects are most commonly preserved in amber, but also lizards, frogs, and birds. Feathers can sometimes be found as well. Uh, but you can see here in the picture, right, to, to preserve the whole body, insects are the right size. Um, 18. Which one of these creatures evolved directly from the dinosaurs? A, birds, B, crocodiles. C, snakes, or D, mammals? We have a lot of votes for A, birds. 
And that is correct again. Birds evolved from a group of dinosaurs called the theropods, and the most famous in which is the T Rex. So when you look at a bird, you're probably looking at a descendant from the T Rex. Question number 19. Which one of these animals has not been found preserving eyes? A, woolly mammoth, B, woolly rhino, B, C, bison, or D, dinosaur? Which of these ones has not been found preserving eyes? It looks like we're getting a lot of responses for D, dinosaur. And that is correct again. When, during the time the dinosaurs lived on the planet, there were very little, if any, eyes on the planet. And in contrast, when bisons, mammoths, and woolly rhinos live, much more recently, uh, we had uh, the poles covered in eyes, so that's why we can find them. And you can see in the picture a baby um, mammoth, I think, uh, preserving eyes. So you guys are doing great tonight. Uh, question number 20 and last question of the night. Which one of these commonly fossilized animals is still alive today? A, ammonites, B, trilobites, C, brachiopods, or D, lasiosaurus. Have another tie between three, oh, between two answers. Okay, so we have a tie between A, ammonites, and C, brachiopods? And the correct answer is C, brachiopods. So you were half right. <laughs> uh, there are about 385 species of brachiopods living, living today, and this compares to over 30,000 species that have gone extinct. And uh, again, if you have the opportunity to come to visit us at some point in the second floor of the museum, we have a collection that you can uh, see these beautiful spe specimens. Uh, so we hope that you want to come and see us at some point. Um, so at this point, this is the last question of the trivia. We want to know how you did. So if you can put in the chat, if you uh, are if you got between zero and 10 answers, you are a fossil enthusiast. If you got between 11 and 15 answers correctly um, answered, you are a paleontologist in training. And if you got between 16 and 20 answers correct, you are a fossil expert. So please let us know how you did. And if you had fun. And once we, we we're going to be monitor, monitoring the chat, but it is 630. So we are going to uh, thank you for playing with Ria and me tonight, but we're going to move on into what's next. And that is the dinosaur fossil activity. And you're going to have to go and collect some uh, materials, the Play-Doh, toy dinosaurs and the glue. And Ria will continue with you uh, into this activity. Thank you, everybody. Howdy. Hey, so hey, everybody. So once again, uh, you can go grab the supplies needed. We are going to make dinosaur fossils. So I have Play-Doh. I have four different colors. You can choose any color you'd like, Play-Doh or clay. Um, you can get toy dinosaurs, or if you don't have toy dinosaurs, you can use little shells. Um, here's a little shell that I have here or anything else that you would like to fossilize um, and you'll also be needing some glue um, so i would recommend not the glue stick but um, the either the elmer's glue or i actually have these glue pens glitter glue pens so you can use that so any kind of liquid glue um, so let's get started with our activity i'm going to switch my camera view so you can see how i'm doing this Okay, so 
Uh, Julie, can you still hear me? And can you see? Yes, we can hear you. Patty, do you want to stop sharing so we can see Rhea's screen a little bigger? Okay, thank you. So here I have some clay, um, some Play-Doh that I've taken out. And I will show you the end product in just a second. Um, but you can take out some Play-Doh or clay. And what you're going to do is you are going to roll it into a little ball. And it depends how much, um, how much Play-Doh you need. If you want to make like a really big fossil, then you might want to take some more Play-Doh. But I'm making kind of like a, a normal size. So it's just a little small ball. Okay, and now I'm going to... Press down a little bit, not too much, but just a, just enough so it's like still thick, and it's a little like a like a flat flatter shape now. You can see that, and I actually have a really cute dinosaur here. So here's my dinosaur, and I think I'm going to make a full body fossil. So you can make fossils. You can find fossils of just tails, right? You can find fossilized footprints. You can find fossils of like just spikes. It's not necessarily all the time that we find like the entire dinosaur. It looks like I might need to make mine a little bigger. So I'm gonna flatten it some more. And so I'm going to now push this in a little bit. And you can like roll it in a little more and you wanna push it in, but not all the way down. Just enough so it makes a little dent. And I'm going to take him out now. Really carefully. Okay, so now you can kind of see it has a really cool shape. And you can see, like, it got the texture in there. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to fill it with glue now. Okay, so... I'm going to take maybe this gold glue that I have. And it actually might work a little better with regular glue, um, which I don't have, but I have this glitter glue. So I'm going to try this and I'm just going to fill it in. I'm going to put some in his foot, in the leg. Go some more in over here. All right, so now I have like a really glittery fossil since I'm using this glitter glue. And so now what you would do is you can leave this out to dry maybe for like two days. And so after two days, you can actually then excavate excavate your dinosaur or your fossil out of there. And that is the next part that I'll show you how to do. So I'm gonna move this to the side. And let me show you the other fossils that I made. All right, so here's one that I made. So here's a little footprint and I excavated out the glitter from there. So it was here. And then I just used a little stick and I took it out. So the shape was not perfect, but you can kind of see that it, it is still a little footprint there. Uh, here's another one that I can try to excavate without ruining the shape here. So this one was the tail of a stegosaurus. And you don't you can make any, you know, you can make any part of the body you want. If you want to do just the head, you can do just the head or you can do just the feet. That is cool. So I am I have a little stick here. You can maybe use a toothpick since mine is a little small. And I'm going to try to scrape it out. Since the glue that I'm using is glitter glue, it might be a little different from if you use the regular glue. It might actually be better if you use regular glue rather than the glitter one that I have here. Trying not to ruin the shape here, but let's see. And you can even, um, if you want to make it more fun, you can put your fossils into um, a box of sand and like bury them up and you can pretend that you can get a brush and you can pretend that you're looking for actual fossils. Okay, I think I did a 
decent job with this one. So I didn't totally ruin that there, but there you go. You can see that. There's the tail. Here's my glitter part. And when you guys are finished making your fossil today, please upload them to the Padlet so that we can see what your creations look like. Um, I can show you how to do the shell not shell fossil now, and then we can check out what you are all making. So I'm going to use pink. And again, roll it into a ball. And then just flatten it out a little. I'm going to push my shell in. And carefully take it out. Show this to you. You can all see this. And I'm going to fill this one up, and I think I will use red for this. All right, so I filled in my little fossil here with some red glue and I'm gonna let that dry for two days and I will then take them out like I just showed you. So let's check out the Padlet and see what you guys are making. Um, hey Julie or Patty, can you guys give me some uh, sharing abilities or if you guys wanna share the screen for the Padlet? Hey Ray, I just made you presenter I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's see what we have here. All right, so let me just refresh. Wow, we have some fossil drawings. That looks really nice. So I'm gonna, that, oh, that's really good. I like this one. And here's another drawing over here that is super cute. Love the colors. There's another one. Oh, I like this one. It's really nice. And here's one that I made. Here's a clam fossil, too. So, yeah, as you are all making your fossils, once you're done, please take a picture and share them with us on the Padlet. Um, so that's all I had for the craft today. And I will now hand it off to... Patty, I think if you want to introduce our speaker. Sure. Dominic, are you here? Yeah. All right. So um, thank you everybody for being with here with us here tonight. We hope you have fun with the trivia and the craft. Uh, but it's that time of the night to receive our guest speaker. And we have Dr. Dominic Diamor. He's an associate professor at Damon College in Buffalo, New York. And we are very excited to learn more about his research and his journey in the sciences. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and welcome to our late night. My pleasure. Um, just let me bring up the screen and we'll get started. Sure. All right. Seems to be loading. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Captions. Just testing the captions. Excellent. Everyone can see the captions, right? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. Well, let's get started. Hi, thank you for introducing me. Uh, my name is Dominic DeMore. 
Um, I actually went to Rutgers to get my PhD. Um, so I know the Jersey area. I I know Rutgers, and uh, I was very honored uh, to speak uh, with you guys. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my work, and also the most how the work I did when I was at Rutgers eventually led to the work that I'm doing right now. Um, and I've always been interested in marks that are left on bones, presumably by dinosaurs. I feel that there's a lot of information that can come from these marks. So I've always been interested in dinosaurs, the marks they leave, but the question is how do they leave those marks and what can we learn from those type of marks? All right, so just to give you an idea, um, this was me when I was in Rutgers. I had a lot more hair. And this is me in my most uh, recent dig. I actually go on a yearly dig to both Utah and New Mexico with the LA County Museum. And we dig up both Jurassic and Cretaceous fossils. This is me with a diplodocid humerus. It's very big. Um, beautiful specimens, a lot of fun. So what's happened in between the picture on the left and the picture on the right? Well, a lot. and. I'm going to talk about how the things that I learned at Rutgers and my research that I started there eventually read, led to the things that I'm doing now. And there's a couple of things I'm going to highlight as I talk about this. I'm going to talk about like um, one thing, how networking and collaborating with other researchers really has helped me refine what I want to do, as well as how you can help. Volunteering in citizen science and just working with the museum and taking an interest in paleontology, even if you're not officially a scientist, is super helpful in the scientific process. And you'll see this a little bit later. So I've always been interested in um, dinosaur teeth, particularly carnivorous dinosaur teeth. Now, the carnivorous dinosaurs or theropods have a very distinct tooth shape. It's called xiphodons. Um, if you were to translate that from Greek, it would mean xiphos means sword and daunt means tooth. So these teeth look kind of like swords or sabers. You can kind of see it. They curve back and they are very much flattened. Okay. Also, they often tend to have serrations. So clearly they're very good at eating meat with these. Okay. But since there are no two dinosaurs left. Yes, birds are dinosaurs, but unfortunately they don't have teeth. So there are no two dinosaurs left. We don't know how, you know, what they, how they use these teeth. I mean, you know, how did they move their head when they bit down? Were they mostly um, scavengers or hunters? Did they hunt in packs? You know, how did they, how did they eat the prey animal after they killed it? All kinds of these questions. We don't know. We have no idea. So one of the questions is, how do these animals use their teeth? And that's what got me into tooth marks. Now, tooth marks, the research on tooth marks belongs to a much larger discipline within paleontology. And we refer to this as taphonomy. Uh, taphonomy means, in the literal translation, the laws of burial. Okay, and if and if you want to think about uh, paleontology from the standpoint of looking at the fossil other than the animal that owned it, this is very helpful. So think about it. You have an animal, the animal dies, it gets buried, and then millions of years later, we dig it up, right? And we could look at the fossil and we could say, okay, this fossil belonged, this bone belonged to this animal and describe the animal. But also what happened to the animal between when it died and when we found it, that's what taphonomy is. So we can look at the bone and see, okay, what condition was it in when it was buried? And how's the fossil look? Does it have any marks? Was it trampled on? Was it bitten? Uh, maybe uh, if it's a more recent fossil from when people are around, did people butcher it? Things like that. Um, is the skeleton in pieces? Is the skeleton all together? So it's things other than the, than the animal itself that we look at when we do taphonomy. And this is a very recent field. If many, um, many people who are paleontology enthusiasts have never heard this word, but it is very helpful because when you look at these fossils, you can determine a lot about the environment 
and the way that the animal lived and died by looking at taphonomy. Archaeologists love it because they love to they love to look at bones to see if you know if they've been butchered by ancient hominids or things like that. But it's not as popular with dinosaurs. So one of the things I wanted to do at Rutgers was apply this discipline to you know dinosaurs. And if you look at the picture on the left, that's Robert Blumenschein. Um, he's an anthropologist over at Rutgers, and I worked with him on several projects. So I want to know about tooth marks. Now, tooth marks to me are the most interesting because they definitely fall within taphonomy because after the animal dies, the bones get gnawed on or chewed on or whatever, and the marks end up being left over. So we can use those marks to determine you know, what type of animal was eating the uh, dead animal, how many were, um, you know, what, what kind of behavior they used to eat it. And you can answer a lot of questions that I have concerning paleontology. So the best way to do experiments with taphonomy is to look at something that is alive now and see how it acts and see what kind of marks it leaves on bones and then compare the marks from the living animal to the fossil. But as I said earlier, there are no toothed dinosaurs left over. Well, we only have birds, they have no teeth. So this puts us in a bad spot. How can we determine how animals with xiphodontation eat if there are none left? Well, there's no dinosaurs with them, but we do have one living animal that has xiphodont teeth, and it's the Komodo dragon. And I just remember being in graduate school and saying, wow, I'm going to do my dissertation work on Komodo dragons. That's really cool. So one of my experiments that I did was I went to zoos and I fed Komodo dragons. I fed them meat and I fed them bones. And I looked to see how the Komodo dragons would eat the meat and if they left marks on the bones. Also, what did the marks look like? How do the marks show the way that the animal consumes the carcass, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I would do is I'll compare them to fossil marks and see what I can learn by comparison. Okay, so this picture I took myself, uh, this is Castor. He is a male Komodo dragon at the Denver Zoo, and he was very hungry, so he helped out. Now you can see these are Komodo dragon teeth on the right, and you can see they're very much xiphodont. They're very curved and serrated and pretty impressive. So what I did, and, and this is an actual video I took watching a Komodo eat, is it's a very simple experiment. I bought um, some butchered goats, right? So I went to the butcher shop, I got a piece of meat, and I tied the rope to it, and I put it in the enclosure, and I let the Komodo go crazy, do whatever it wanted to do. And then after the Komodo was finished, I took it out, and I boiled the meat off of the bones, and then I examined the bones to look at the marks that the animal left. And uh, as you can see here, they weren't shy. They had no problem uh, moving the carcass, biting down on the carcass, pulling the carcass. Yeah, so it was, it was, it was, we got a lot of good data from it. And we got a lot of good marks too. And Komodos are actually really cute. <laughs> they, you expect them to be scary, but they, they actually, they're actually really cute, and the ones at the zoos are very well trained, so they, they were great for my research. All right, so these are some of the kind of marks that I found. And I found three major types of marks that Komodos leave with their xiphodont teeth. They either drag their teeth across the bone with the tip, and that leaves something we call a score. Or what they do is they take their tooth and they jab it into the bone, and then they pull it back out. Typically, this is just because they got a bad angle. We refer to this as a pit. And the last kind of mark is something I call an edge mark. And this is unique to xiphodont animals. Because what happens is, as the Komodo would drag its teeth back, sometimes the back edge of the tooth would chop into bone and get stuck. And then they'd pull it out and start over, right? This resulted in the edge mark, as you can see on the bottom right. So we have three major types of marks that were left by Komodos, okay? Uh, and this was very interesting. So for this study, I, I measured how many of these, I measured how long they are, how much they curve, the, you know, the relative amounts, et cetera, et cetera. 
what I did is I then compared them to um, tooth marks from Mesozoic fossils that we find in that we have in the literature. So in papers and publications, etc. Um, and you can see they are very similar. Okay, so it's very interesting what I found. I found that the Komodo dragon and theropod dinosaurs produce very similar marks when they drag their teeth, or when they when they consume carcasses and when they drag their teeth across bones. So this was a nice you know little study, and it showed that we can use modern animals like the Komodo dragon to learn about dinosaurs, and it was really a good study. So. Another thing that I found that was interesting was sometimes a tooth will move across the bone and leave little stripes. We call these stripes striations. And the reason they do that is because they have a serrated edge, like a like you know, like a serrated knife, right? They have a serrated edge on their tooth. And when they eat, they scrape the bone and leave little marks from these serrations and we call these striations Now you might not be able to see them now but if you zoom in there they are and they're these little marks that run across the bone and i thought this was really interesting because there have been no studies that look at how these were produced but the komodos made them and we find them with dinosaurs all the time so this is another really interesting thing i found so another question I had is, can we learn anything interesting about the animal from these striated marks? Okay. So what I did is I looked at some teeth of some dinosaurs and I found an interesting thing. What happens is as the dinosaur gets bigger, the serrations on its teeth get bigger. And as the serrations on its teeth would get bigger, you'd expect that these striations or those marks on the bone would get bigger too. So I found that you can actually figure out the size of the dinosaur based on these special kind of marks, okay? It's a little more complicated than that, but for the most part, that's the case. So if we find a mark with those stripes or striations, we can in theory say how big the animal is that ate it. And that's really interesting to, to scientists because we wanna know, you know who was eating who, because we can't go back in time and see it. So in order to figure that out, this is a great way to figure it out. We can't tell the individual species, but we can tell the size. So that's what I did when I was at Rutgers. Then I graduated from Rutgers Ecology and Evolution and I got my job at Damon and I've been working there um, for, oof, it's about 11 years now. Okay, so a couple of years ago, a, uh, a researcher contacted me, she's a friend of mine, uh, who works out of the University of Tennessee and she studies taphonomy too. She's interested in crocodile tooth marks. And she said to me, I am doing a study where I'm looking at I'm looking at tooth marks uh, with a coworker of mine in Colorado. Do you want to work with me? And I go, sure. And that's, by the way, how science works. It's not very, you know, we're not competing with each other. We want to work together. There's lots of good collaboration. And this is an example of that collaboration. I study Komodo dragon marks. She studies croc marks. It's good. We make a good team. Now, the person that she works with is Julia McHugh, it's over in the Museum of Western Colorado. And she is in charge of all of these digs that go on every summer there, where they dig up numerous fossils from the Jurassic. Many, many types of ankylosaurs, uh, diplodocids, allosaurids, things like that. Some of these you may have heard of, some of you may not have, but it's a, it's a really good site to dig at. Now, this quarry, which is called the Migat Moor Quarry, which is named after the people who dug, who who found it. Okay, they have all kinds of things. I mentioned some of the dinosaurs. They also have crocodiles, crocodiliomorphs, which are just outside uh, crocodilians, turtles, fish, a bunch of aquatic invertebrates, all kinds of things you could possibly want. But what's really interesting is that they have two big predators. And these big predators are very interesting for the kind of research she wants to do. Um, they have 
Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. Ceratosaurus is on the left, Allosaurus is on the right. And they lived at the same time, and they were both the big predators in the area. Um, now, there's other predators that could have lived there that live around the same time, but they've never been found there. Okay, so Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus are the only ones that have been confirmed in the area. Okay, so why does this matter? Oops, excuse me. Well, here's my pitch for citizen science. There's lots of volunteers that work at the My Get More Quarry, and they have collected thousands of fossils for over 30 years. And it's all museum staff or museum volunteers, you know, high school kids, some middle school kids, locals who just want to dig in the dirt for a little bit. They come out and they help. And they have found many, 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 many fossils. Now, not all these fossils are pretty. Some of them are ugly, ugly fossils. They're broken pieces or chipped or worn or damaged or something like that. But because she had, because Julia had so many great people working for her, she had the staffing to collect all of them, okay? So they have lots and lots of great fossils and some that aren't that great. And it's the ones that aren't that great looking that are valuable to me. Because what she did is she hired a college student. Now, I believe that many of you, you know, may have aspirations to go to college and may want to study paleontology. Well, this is a geology student right here, um, uh, Miriam, who is looking at these fossils and she's cataloging them and going through each of them. And so that's one way that she's helping out as well. So what happened is this, Miriam and Anya, which are two college students, you know, they're 19 years old, 20 years old. They went through all those fossils, over 2,300 fossils, and looked at all of them for tooth marks. And what they found was a lot of tooth marks, over 600 tooth marks. This is amazing. So I'm very excited about this. My my friend and coworker um, Stephanie are really excited about this too. We have all these tooth marks on all these bones. Maybe we can look at them and see what kind of information we can find out by looking at these tooth marks. Okay, so that's what we did. It was myself, Julia, and Stephanie. We all worked together with these two students, and we looked at all these marks and we tried to figure out as much as we could about the ancient environment or what we call ecosystem from them. So there were lots of marks, okay, and many of them, many of them were um, striated. So they had those little stripes. And if you look at uh, the diagram A, clearly there's lots of stripes on that one, lots of striations. So what I did is, um, so what we did is we looked at the parts of the skeletons that were marked, and we also tried to figure out the size of the animals that made these marks. Okay, so first let's talk about the parts. Okay, so this is Myomora pelta. It's an ankylosaur. Lots of ankylosaur scoots and leg bones and things like that, and they were scratched up all over the place. We also had many diplodocids like this diplodocus, right, scratched up all over the meaty parts, the legs, and also some parts like the tail and some parts you wouldn't expect that have a lot of meat on them. So we thought this was a little surprising. And then we also found marked up allosaurus bones and it's like that's interesting that means that a predator was eating one of these predators now that doesn't necessarily mean that the allosaurus was a lot was alive and killed by another predator it might have just died and something ate it so we don't know that but we do know that this is predator on predator feeding what was really cool is the place where the place on the skeleton where the bones were marked. The dead Allosaurus had bones in its tail and its toes that were chewed on. So we said to ourselves, there's not a lot of meat on there. That's not what I would want to eat. If I was eating an Allosaurus, I wouldn't eat tail and toes. It's, you know, why would you eat that? And this is the interesting thing. In modern, like, like in, with, concerning like lions and hyenas and modern predators, they'll only eat the toes and the tail and the, that stuff if there's nothing else to eat. So 
we were able to figure out that this, what we call assemblage, or the fossil, the environment where these fossils were accumulated, was an environment where there wasn't a lot of food. Probably these things had died, and the carcass was taken apart, and then the animals were still so hungry that they were gnawing on toe bones and tails. So this is what we call a stressed environment, or an environment where, you know, beggars can't be choosers, and I'm just going to eat anything I can find. And like I said, we looked at the striated tooth marks in order to figure out the size of the animal that was making the marks, right? Um, now, some of the striated tooth marks indicate your typical sized allosaurus and ceratosaurus. And you can see, relatively speaking, how big these animals are to a person. But we also found some tooth marks that indicate there was something bigger. So, this is Torvosaurus. We've never found a Torvosaurus in this area, but we know they lived around that time. So, Torvosaurus very big guy okay and torvosaurus and the tooth mark said maybe torvosaurus was also there making tooth marks so the tooth marks show that even though we haven't found bones there might be an even bigger animal at the site and then we found tooth marks that are so big they may indicate this animal which is called sorophaganax which is a huge allosaur relative of allosaurus and this size animal was probably the only size animal that made some of the marks. So not only did the marks tell us a lot about what kind of environment there was, how much food there was, who was eating whom, but also we can hypothesize animals that lived there from tooth marks and ate there, even if we don't actually have their skeletons. So this, is, this was really, really interesting. So we came to a lot of conclusions, you know, either Ceratosaurus was scavenging on Allosaurus, maybe Allosaurus was cannibalizing on itself, and maybe even there was an even bigger predator there that we just haven't found bones of yet that was eating. All of this information from tooth marks, so really, really exciting. And then the icing on the cake, we published it, it was a great paper, we were really happy about it, and those are all the authors, I'm the one at the end, and then, in order to kind of add a little drama to it, we hired a paleo artist, okay? And this is Brian Eng. He's a wonderful, wonderful paleo artist. This is him holding up the award at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology for the best art. And we hired, we're like, you're the best. Please, we, wanna, we want you to do a picture of this scene of this stress environment with Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus eating. So he came up with this, boom, pretty, pretty intense, right? So you have Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus fighting over an Allosaurus carcass. It's old, it's smelly, there's bugs everywhere, and it's just an environment where there's not a lot of food, so they're at each other's throats eating whatever they can. And um, so that's that's my story. So it started off back in the 2000s at Rutgers, studying tooth marks of Komodo dragons. And now we're learn we, learned about some we learned something about the way Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus live their lives. So it was, a, it was great research. And um, that's my talk. Thank you for having me here. And I, I'm looking forward to any questions. All right, Dominic, you can unshare your screen and then go over to the Google Doc where we've started compiling the questions. Okay. And if anyone does have any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll make sure Dominic gets to answer them. All right. Wow, these questions, a lot of questions. Oh, geez. Excellent. All right. So the first question is, what is the most unusual fossil you have found, and where was it? Um, hmm, that's a tough one. Uh, so when I was in New Mexico, I found, <laughs> it's kind of interesting, I found several turtle shells. And turtle shells are kind of boring. 
But what's really interesting is these turtle shells were kind of strange. The, they had long rib-like structures and the shells were incomplete. And what I realized is they're all what we call trinychids or soft shell turtles. So they were so unusual to me. They're not unusual if you know those shells, but they were so unusual to me that I spent the whole day trying to figure out what they were. And then I went to a turtle expert and I'm like, what is this? And it's like, oh, it's a trinychid. It's a soft shell turtle. I'm like, wow. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. Another interesting fossil that I found is um, the teeth of sauropods, which are dinos which are long neck dinosaurs, are very rare. And we found titanosaur teeth just laying out on the ground. And they were very unusual and very interesting. Titanosaur teeth are basically like little pencils with pegs at the end. And they were fascinating. So those were two interesting fossils I found. The rest of the fossils that I found are pretty much um, stuff you'd expect to find from uh, your typical uh, allosaurids or sauropods or whatever. Are fossils found on all continents? Yes. Yes, they are. That's a great question. Um, we have found in... Dinosaurs alone have been found on all continents. They have um, North American fossils are clearly very common. I have coworkers in Argentina who dig up fossils in South America, lots of them. Um, they're actually some close friends of mine that are from Argentina. Uh, Europe is where dinosaurs were named. So we have clearly have dinosaurs from Europe. There are African fossils, typically early, earlier fossils like those from the Triassic. They're definitely very common. Recently, they've found dinosaurs in Australia as well. Uh, and the fossils from Asia, from China, have been absolutely gorgeous. There's some beautiful fossils from Asia as well. Um, Velociraptors from Mongolia. And now we have, um, you know, um, Microraptors from China, as well as several other dinosaurs. So, yes, fossils are found on all continents. But if you notice, I left out a continent, Antarctica. Well... I have a friend, Matt Lamana, who works at the Pittsburgh Museum, and he studies, um, excuse me, he studies fossils from Antarctica. He actually goes there and he digs up Antarctic fossils. So um, yeah, every continent. That's a great question. Okay, another question. Where was the first fossil? Where was the first fossil you ever found? And where was the biggest fossil? you have ever found? Well, the first fossil I ever found was in New Mexico, and it was the jawbone of um, something called Bista herverser, which is a smaller version of Tyrannosaurus. So it's a Tyrannosaurid. And I was walking around doing what we call prospecting, where I'm just looking for, you know, stuff eroding out of rocks. And I saw this very nice brown piece coming out of a rock. This is with a friend and co-worker Pedro Motro, who works over in um, um, Lisbon. And uh, we found that. And we ended up, we're still digging up that animal now. Okay, even several years later, we had to remove the top of a mountain. So the first fossil I ever found, we're still working on getting it out because it's really deep in a hill. And the biggest fossil I've ever found, uh, Diplodocus, easily. Diplodocus, we found a Diplodocus in, um, in the Morrison Formation, which is Jurassic sediment in Utah. Uh, and diplodocids are very big. We believe the animal that came from is probably 50 tons when it was alive. So very, very large. I got a question from Jamie. Is it possible to determine the color of a dinosaur from its fossils? Usually no, sometimes yes. Okay. So there are some smaller dinosaurs. So typically, no, typically it's just, just the bones. But there are some smaller dinosaurs that they found in China where they, the, they have feathers. And um, um, Cinceropteryx is actually one of them. Cinceropteryx was a small feathered theropod dinosaur. And it is preserved so well that you can see the feathers. And the feathers are preserved so well that pigments are actually preserved and what we found is that the tail of this animal was actually striped it went black white black white black white so it kind of looked like a lemur tail 
So although rare, there are circumstances where you can actually determine the color of a fossil of an animal based on its fossils. Like I said, not super common, but it happens. What is the tallest dinosaur? That's very interesting. Hmm, I have to think about that. Typically they say what is the longest dinosaur, what is the heaviest dinosaur? But the tallest, I don't know. Hmm. It might be Argentinosaurus. Those guys were big. Or it might be um Titanosaurus. It's definitely one of the uh, titanosaurs. Now, titanosaur are long-necked dinosaurs that live in South America and Southern North America in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, mostly the Cretaceous. I'm willing to bet it's probably one of those guys. I don't know for sure. I haven't measured them, but that's definitely the group that you want to look at. Is it possible to determine the size of an animal from its tooth? Well, the study I was doing showed that you can generally determine the size of the animal based on the serrations on its tooth. So, yeah, that's one of the things that I discovered. Now, it's not perfect because teeth are different sizes, so it can vary. And also, not every dinosaur has serrated teeth. So, so it doesn't work every time, but it works some of the time. And we've actually made a lot of progress determining the size of animals from their teeth. And here's another thing. With our teeth, as humans, we have the same teeth for most of our lives. You have your baby teeth, they fall out, then you have your adult teeth, and they stay for the rest of your life. But dinosaurs kept making new teeth. Their teeth would fall out and they'd grow new ones, and they'd fall out and grow new ones. Okay, most reptiles do this. So, as the animal gets bigger, the teeth get bigger as well. And if we can come up with a, a rate for how much the animal grows with, as the teeth grow, we can figure out how big the animal is. So for the most part, yeah. What is the strangest location that you found a fossil? Hmm. Let's see. I can't really think of any place that's too strange. Uh, let's see. So one time I found a Tyrannosaurus tooth at the very tippy top of a hill, which I thought was crazy because you'd expect these Tyrannosaur teeth to erode out of the side of the hill and fall down. But this tooth was at the very tip top of the hill. And I was really, it was a big one. It was like this big chunky Tyrannosaurus tooth. And I was like, why is it here? Um, so I thought it was very strange that it was at the top of this hill. So what I think happened is actually someone probably found it and then put it up on top of the hill. So I thought that was a little strange. But I have to admit, I haven't really found too many fossils in too strange places. Um, typically, the work that I do, we've already found the fossils, and I'm the one digging it up. So um, I, I would actually be interested to ask some of my paleontologist friends, and they'll probably have much more interesting answers. All right, next question. Are you able to determine the health of the dinosaur from its teeth? The health of dinosaurs is a very interesting topic. We refer to this as something called paleopathology. Okay, so pathos means sickness. And of course, paleontology means of ancient life, right? So paleopathology is looking at fossils to determine if the animal was sick or well and what evidence there is. I don't know if there are any studies done on dinosaur teeth and looking at the health of their teeth, but there are lots of studies looking at the health of other dinosaur skeletal parts. So there's lots of research looking at uh, arthritis in dinosaur joints. So hadrosaurs or the duck-billed dinosaurs, they had frequent arthritis. And if you look at some of the bones in their joints, they are uh, they, they don't look too good. They're all abraded and have nodules on them, which indicates that as they got older, they had arthritic joints. Uh, also, Sue, arguably the most famous um, Tyrannosaurus, that one has actually has a jaw infection and has holes in its jaw based on some sort of uh, parasite that was infecting its jaw. Uh, and also, there are dinosaurs that show injuries that they've recovered from. You have uh, broken bones that healed up, or the tail has been broken in places, or 
some of the spines sticking up on the back were cracked and healed up. So I don't know about anything with teeth, but there is lots of studies that have looked at health of dinosaurs or paleopathology. Are there other animals, other animals other than Komodo dragons that could be used in the study, maybe like crocodiles? So, as I said, I, my coworker, Stephanie, she loves looking at crocodiles and looking at crocodile tooth marks. Here's the thing about crocodiles is because of their lifestyle of living in water and preying on animals in, in rivers and in water and rolling to dismember carcasses and such, Okay, their teeth have been highly modified, and they used to be xiphodonts about 200 plus million years ago, but since then they've changed. So although they're good, um, good for research looking at ancient crocodiles and other aquatic reptiles, they're not so good for dinosaurs anymore. So we use them to study different things. Uh, Ria's mom would like to know, uh, can pollutants and toxins from oil spills impact fossilized teeth? So we typically don't dig in places where there are lots of pollutants and toxins. Um, a lot of it, it's, so in an indirect way, pollutants and toxins can impact fossils. Not necessarily the chemicals themselves, but when people destroy the environment to get to oil or to you or to get to fossil fuels or to frack into um into natural gas and things like that those that can damage um that can damage fossils so um in a way it's not like the pollutants would impact the fossilized teeth in that they would the stuff underground would influence it um it's more that us getting to that stuff may influence, uh, it may negatively influence teeth. We might break them, we might go through the sediment, things like that. Um, now what's nice is a lot of the times when people want to dig up fossils, I mean, I'm sorry, when people want to dig up uh, fossil fuels, they have to have a paleontologist on site to make sure there are no valuable fossils in the area. C Connie says, uh, in your field, what is the biggest unsolved mystery or unexplained fossil that I want answered? Oof. Well, there's there's lots of things. Um, so one of the big questions that we have, actually, this is one of the most interesting things, is during the Cretaceous, there's not a lot of medium-sized dinosaurs. You have big, medium dinosaurs. There's big tyrannosaurids, like tyrannosaurus, and then you have very small things. So where's the medium-sized ones? Well, what scientists are thinking now is that the medium-sized dinosaurs were actually the juvenile Tyrannosauruses. And juvenile Tyrannosauruses uh, occupied the, um, it's what we call niche or the area where, uh, the ecological area where medium-sized predators would be. So that's one question, like why were there no medium-sized dinosaurs? And we think that the medium-sized dinosaurs were actually teenage tyrannosaurids and they ate medium-sized prey and then they sometimes grew up into large dinosaurs. Uh, there's lots of other questions. Uh, another question is, the dinosaurs, it's the evolution of flight. Um, birds are dinosaurs. So dinosaurs learned how to fly at some point. Question is when, how many times, were there different styles of flight? Some dinosaurs actually have four wings where they their legs were built like their wings on their arms. But modern birds only have two wings. What was going on there? Why did the ones with four wings die out but the ones with two wings live? Uh, to me, I think the most interesting question is, why did certain dinosaurs and birds lose their teeth? That's what I want to know. Because there's lots of hypotheses, but I don't think they're great. So I'm actually doing research to figure out if there is a reason why some animals, including some dinosaurs, lost their teeth and evolved a beak and other ones didn't. This is something I personally think is really interesting. Which dinosaur would you say the Komodo dragon most resembles? Well, tooth-wise, it's very similar to um, 
the uh, Dromaeosaurs. So Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Bambi Raptor, Dromaeosaurus, Utah Raptor, etc. They had the most flattened and the most curved teeth. So from a tooth perspective, definitely those guys. They also had teeth around the similar size. So I would say if you want to use a Komodo dragon as a dinosaur analog, which is what I did, you definitely want to do that. Ever found a T-Rex? I found a relative of the T-Rex, like I said, Vista Herverser, but I've never found a T-Rex. My research mostly looks in southern United States. If you want a T-Rex, you got to go to the northern part of the United States or Canada. Go to Alberta, go to Montana, the Dakotas. That's where you want to go. I haven't dug there yet, but I'd like to, and maybe I'll find a T-Rex. So here's hoping. Is there any evidence of small mammals gnawing small bones like mice do for calcium? That is an excellent question. I haven't found any. And I actually know a researcher in Argentina who studies therapsids, which is the group that mammals belong to, but this is older than mammals. So this is a group more ancient than mammals. And I asked him, are there small therapsids that leave marks on bones? And he goes, I don't know. And so we haven't really found much concerning gnawing on bones from small mammals. But another thing is a lot of researchers don't look for it. Um, historically, what we do is we try to find the most pretty bones and that's the ones we dig up. But ugly fossils have a lot of tooth marks. Now we haven't found any with small mammal marks, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. So perhaps they're out there. We just have to keep looking. And we also have to shift the, uh, the focus away from the pretty bones to the uglier bones, okay? That's a great question. And hopefully, maybe I'll do that research or maybe you'll do that research because that's a really interesting question. How are new uh, dinosaur species or fossils named? Okay, so this is, <laughs> it's not super complicated, but it's an interesting process. Um, so when you find a dinosaur, when you find a fossil, and if you think it's a new species, you have to describe it. And so you describe it by looking at all the parts of the skeleton that you find. Whatever bones you have, you have to describe all the parts, every nodule, every process, every single little part of all the bones. And then you need to figure out how it different it is from other dinosaurs. So you need to make an argument that this is not this uh, just another T-Rex or another Triceratops hordis or another whatever, or Velociraptor, Mongoliansis. You have to make an argument that it's different. And then what you do is you compare it to other dinosaurs that are closely related to see how it relates to the other ones. And then you name it. And you can kind of just make up the name as you like. Um, there's all kinds of ways to name things. You can name it after the uh, you can name it after the place you found it. You can name it after characteristics of its skeleton. Uh, sometimes it's named after people. Typically, when a dinosaur is named after people, you name it after you know a mentor or someone who's a great scientist or um, for example, uh, the person that's funding the dig. So I dig with the LA County Museum, and they dug up a hadrosaur. Um, and the people that funded the dig uh, were named Augustine. That was their last name. So the dinosaur was named Augustinolophus, which means Augustine's dinosaur with a crest. Okay, so that's all kinds of ways. Um, actually, one of my favorite names is not a dinosaur, but it's an ancient turtle, and it's called Ninjemis. Now, Emmys means turtle. Ninja Emmys, ninja turtle. So they actually named the turtle, the, a fossil turtle, the ninja turtle. That, that was a lot of fun. Those were around when I was a kid too. What are, fossil, what are the fossils that the college students examine now? Um, so a lot of times we don't know because, like I said, they're ugly fossils, so a lot of them are broken pieces. But the fossils that they were examining, a lot of ribs, a lot of parts of ribs from um, uh, diplodocids and, uh, uh, and chylosaurs, 
uh, lots of scoots. So what a scoot is, is it's the little plates along the back of ankylosaurs, um, little uh, hand bones and foot bones, which we call um, phalanges, metatarsals, metacarpals. Those are ones that are laying around. Like I said, they found the ugly fossils, the little ones, the ones that are just laying around, and they looked at those, and they, they did a great job. Okay, so that's what they were looking at. And like I said, there's a lot of interesting information in those. Um, oh, and I, I misread the question. Where are the fossils? Where do we put fossils after we study them? Museums. Okay, this is another pitch for museums. When you go into a museum and you look at the cool specimens that are out, those aren't where all the fossils are. In the back rooms, you have collections. After collections, you've got drawers. Uh, and you open the drawers, and there are fossils in those drawers. And that's what the scientists look at. So when a fossil is discovered and you want to catalog it and put it somewhere, you put it in a museum. This is why museums are important. They're not just for people to go look at cool mounted skeletons. They're also a place for scientists to look at collections. And I was just in Pittsburgh at the um, Carnegie Museum, and I was looking at some reptile collections. And I'm going to go back and look at their paleo collections. This isn't in the front, it's in the back. Next question, how long does it take to find fossils and where is there an abundance of them? All right, so it's, it's, it's a little bit of luck, but also you have to know where to look, okay? So um, when you're looking for fossils, you want to go to a place that has good preservation. So what you do is you tend to walk around and if you see fossils eroding out of those rocks, you know, even if they're not in good shape, you know that at least this is an environment where preservation is good. Also, you want to look at certain, um, you look at, you want to look at certain uh, time periods. So if you study dinosaurs, you want to study Mesozoic um, sediments. You don't want to go to a place like I live in Western New York. In Western New York, there are no Mesozoic sediments. We have Devonian, Ordovician, and more recent, like Pleistocene. So there's mammoths, and we have ancient corals, but no dinosaurs. So you want to look at certain places, and you want to, um, you know, and you want to go to, and you want to look at certain time periods. So where I do my prospecting are the badlands of New Mexico, and we have very good preservation there, and it's Cretaceous. So that's a really great place to find new fossils. Uh, another thing is the type of sediment. So you want sediment that tends to accumulate fossils. So right now I'm digging in Utah in an ancient riverbed. It's desert now, but back in the day, it was a riverbed. So this riverbed accumulated fossils. Animals would die in the river, they get washed downstream, and they get stuck and get buried. Great place to find fossils. So that's one of the ways you can, uh, so that's one of the ways you can determine uh, where fossils are. And like I said, an abundance of them would be found there. Also, there are some sediments that uh, actually are really terrible at preserving fossils. Um, sometimes they get too acidic and then they just break down the fossil and it doesn't preserve. Um, other times, they just, there are just no fossils around. Mary would like to know, how do you tell if the predator bit once, more than once, or moved over a small amount? That is a tough one, okay? Um, and it's a very good question. So one of the things that we actually have trouble doing is determining if a tooth mark was made, both, if a bunch of tooth marks were made from a bunch of teeth during one bite or several bites. It's very hard to tell, okay? Uh, another thing that uh, we, we have trouble telling is how many animals ate the bone. Was it just one animal that was just going absolutely crazy? Or were there several animals eating a carcass? These things are really hard to tell. This is one of the reasons why we do experiments with live animals. So what I found is when Komodo dragons eat, they scrape their teeth over a bone over and over and over and over to pop off a piece of meat. And they leave marks that are parallel to one another, one next to the other, next to the other, next to the other. And so I was like, okay, this indicates that several movements of the jaw result in several marks that look like this. And that was very helpful to me. 
And we assume that if we find marks similar in fossils, that means that a dinosaur was probably going scrape, 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 and removing uh, meat that way. But it's at the end of the day, it's just a guess. So it, it's very difficult to tell. Um, so yeah, we don't know. We can just do experiments with modern animals to make educated guesses. And I'm really, really pushing for more experiments with live animals to learn about dinosaurs. That's one of the things that I personally like. What kind of fossils do you find in Antarctica? Well, there's one that's one that pops into my head. It's um, is it Chrysorolophus, I believe is the name. It means cold crested lizard or cold crested dinosaur. It's a medium to it's a medium sized allosaurus sized predator and it has this interesting little crest it almost looks like a, a little tiara i'm not kidding i'm serious it looks like a little tiara that's coming off of the top of this animal's head um and that is one of the major finds that you find in antarctica um, other fossils that you can find in antarctica are actually much older we found several different ancient amphibians and i mean ancient ancient amphibians that tell us a lot about the evolution of what we call tetrapods which are all four-legged animals so they've been a wealth of interesting information from dinosaurs as well as much older deposits now keep in mind the reason we find these fossils in antarctica is because antarctica wasn't where it is now now it's cold but back then it was much further north. It was still in the Southern Hemisphere. I don't think it's ever not been there, but it definitely was warmer. And therefore you would find an ecosystem that's much more similar to um, maybe Jersey or at some points to Canada, but definitely not as harsh as Antarctica is now. So you can find a lot more life there then than you would now. And I believe that's the last question. So. Uh, those were excellent questions, and I'm really happy to be here and answer any questions and answer all these questions. And also, I just want to say um, it's great to be here, and museums are great. You should always go to museums, volunteer at museums, work with museums. Uh, they're a resource that without them, I wouldn't be able to do my research, and I don't even know if I'll have an interest, I'd have an interest in dinosaurs if it wasn't for museums. Thank you so much, Dominic, and I completely agree with you. Um, and that was a very interesting talk. I loved every second of it, and I have so many more questions for you, but um, we are all done here for tonight. And thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. Um, we hope you had fun as well. And so we will be starting up our Ask a Geologist series on October 21st. And so our first speaker will be Michael Schwab, and he will be speaking about Meteor Crater that's located in Arizona. And he'll be talking about, um, you know, he'll be talking all about that Behringer Crater. Um, so join us on uh, Thursday, October 21st uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And thanks again, Dominic, it was great having you. And we hope you have, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.